for coming to our second Hawaii Small Business Conference. I'm Tina Rasmussen. I'm the director of the Mayor's Office of Economic Development for the County of Maui. And I've also been a small business owner with my husband. For 40 years, we have owned Paradise Flower Farms. So I have walked a few thousand miles in your shoes. <laughs> um, what you've done today is really one of the most important things that you can do for your business, and that's leave it for a few hours. Because so many of us are so busy in our businesses, putting out fires, working on employee schedules, filling orders, filing taxes, and more taxes, and more taxes, and more government paperwork. It really becomes really difficult to gain perspective about your business when you're so focused on those daily things. So the fact that you came out today is really, really going to be helpful. We have a wonderful lineup for you. And um, I, I'm so glad that you took this opportunity. We have... Um, are co-producing this uh, with Maui Economic Development Board. They are a wonderful partner. They are the private economic development entity on the island, and we are the public economic development entity. We also have sponsors today. We want to thank the Maui News, Maui Printing Company, Pacific Media Group. We want to thank our community partners in our Maui uh, our chambers, Maui Chamber of Commerce, the Maui Native Hawaiian Chamber of Commerce, the Lanai Chamber of Commerce, the Molokai Chamber of Commerce. Do I hear some Molokai people in the house today, right? Are you here yet? I think they're, they're on their way. Maui Filipino Chamber of Commerce. And also the Maui Hotel and Lodging Association and the Small Business Administration. And as you know, this is National Small Business Week. And this is why we have chosen this week to have this conference. It's my pleasure to now introduce our co-presenting partner. And she is the president and CEO of Maui Economic Development Board, Ms. Leslie Wilkins. Thank you very much, Tina. As she said, happy National Small Business Week. This week is all about celebrating you, recognizing the amazing contributions that you make to our economy and to our community. But it's also appropriate today to recognize Tina. Um, the Small Business Administration each year during this week um, looks at champions and advocates that have gone above and beyond to improve our economy, to be advocates for our environment so small businesses can succeed and continue to be the backbone of our economy. And Tina's so modest, but I want to give her the kudos uh, that she deserves. Not only did she just receive the Maui County Advocate for Small Business and Industry Award, but she has won the State of Hawaii Award for that. Please help me congratulate her. And this conference, for all of her years of being a champion for small business, this really is her vision as director of OED, and we're honored to be your partner in it because truly public-private partnerships always work well. Thank you, Tina. Thank you. Thanks, Leslie. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So uh, we have a few housekeeping things. So I'm um, going to direct you to the slides. I wanted you to know who are your partners in the audience today that you have a wonderful opportunity to network with. Uh, we have some great demographics for you. It couldn't be a better spread across the growing businesses. Everything from startups to some very, very mature businesses. So there's opportunities for you small startups to be mentored and network with some very seasoned business owners that I'm sure will be happy to share lessons learned. 
Um, also, the size of businesses that are here represented today really span and cross the spectrum. Everything um, from small business to large business and types of business. So please look at the slide to see everything from professional services to agriculture and forestry and, of course, accommodations and food services and everything in between. So again, it's really a nice reflection of all the services and needs that make up our small business community. And then now going to the size, again, we have a full pie chart, everything from the sole proprietors who are working it all by themselves to some of our larger employers with more than 200 employees. So, uh, and how wonderful to create those teaming agreements between our large companies who need the services of our small solo practitioners. So we hope today we'll see some of those teaming conversations. So now we have some um, activities for you next. So we're going to ask you to open up your cell phones and open up your browsers. Um, to do a little work. We're going to use a meeting SIFT software. If you've ever attended any of MEDB's and OED's conferences, we always do this as a community engagement tool. So if I could have the slide up with the instructions on how to go to your browsers. So this is, so it's SIFT.LY. And then your participation code is the acronym for the conference, HSBC. So I'm going to give you all a minute to pull that up on your browsers. And we're going to ask you to answer a couple questions with just one word, just a one word response. And then it will populate a word cloud. So has everyone been able to open your browsers and get on the sif.ly? Not OK, I'm going to give you another minute or two. All right, so it's still up on the screen. So we have two questions for you. And remember, a one-word response. I know that's hard with just one cup of coffee, but because you can probably populate this with many. So what do you hope to get out of the conference today? Why are you here? With one word, what do you hope to get out of the conference today? Important feedback for us. So here they go. The word cloud is populating. So to let you know how this works, the more frequently a word is selected by the audience, the larger the type. So obviously, knowledge, inspiration, information, networking, very common denominator among your words that you're choosing. It seems that knowledge is staying at the heart as the number one thing that people are desiring today. And trust me, with the lineup of speakers and panelists we have today, I think much knowledge will be imparted. OK, we have one more question for you. Thank you for the, all those responses. So again, in one word, as the owner, principal, operator of your business, what is your greatest challenge? Again, as the owner, operator, principal, what is your greatest challenge in your business? In just one word. I know that's tough, but try to synthesize it and pick one. Mm. Wow. As we know, employees are the centerpieces of all our businesses. They are our greatest asset, so this is no surprise. So thank you, everyone, for participating in this. And then my last housekeeping is please, please, when you get our evaluations, green, look like this, please take the time to fill them out and give us feedback. It's very important in helping us shape continued services to the small business community and future conferences. And we have a little incentive for you. If you stay, complete this, and you are present, we have some prizes for the completion 
of our evaluation and conference feedback form. Again, green form, don't lose it, please complete it. And now, it is my pleasure to make an introduction and a welcome home. Our mayor, Mayor Alan Arakawa, has been traveling. He's been in Korea on mission work for our community. And he literally is just back home. And it is my pleasure to have him join us this morning on the stage with some welcoming remarks. And I'm sure you're very familiar with his long public service career on the county council and mayor of our county. But what you may not know is Mayor Arakawa is a small business owner, has been a small business owner for as long as he can remember. So it's only appropriate that we ask him to welcome. Thank you, Mayor, for joining us this morning. Well, good morning, everyone. And thank you all for volunteering to be lifetime learners. Thank you for volunteering to be probably the hardest workers you'll ever have as employees of yourself and for taking on challenges that you will constantly have and being able to try and work through every possible situation that you can't even imagine yet. You know, starting a small business and maintaining a small business requires an infinitesimal amount of talent and knowledge. You have to be an accountant, you have to be a salesperson, you have to be someone who can order things, be able to recognize what's a good product, what's a bad product, do market evaluation, learn about world events, learn about community events, what's good within the community, what's wanted, what's not wanted. It doesn't end. And there are very few people within our community that have the courage to be able to take on all of these challenges. And knowing that every day you wake up, there's gonna be something else that you're gonna to have to be able to deal with. And do it with a smile. Greet every customer or client with that same smile and cheery disposition because that's the way you grow business. You know, having been in small business and I've had, um, Let's see. I had a shell business when I was in grade school. <laughs> I did a lay stand when I was in, I think, second grade. I've had an insurance company, real estate, printing company, florist, graphics company. And <clears throat> I'm running this small business of 2,600 employees in the county right now. I can tell you that not a day goes by without a challenge. And if we're going to be successful, we always have to have an open mind. We have to look for opportunities, and we have to be out there being part of the community, being contributors within the community as well. So Maui is very, very fortunate, and all of you are very, very fortunate in that one thing that really stands out for Maui County is we all tend to work together, and we all try and help each other to move forward. So I thank you in advance for being partners in our community because without your willingness to put yourself through all the sacrifices that you're going to have to and to be able to do all of the transactions that you're going to have to, the county could not exist. It's really the backbone of our community and our economic system, our small businesses, really, truly. And it's individuals like yourselves who are willing to put yourselves on the line that will make it successful. So as mayor of Maui County, I thank you very much for attending, for caring enough to attend, and to learn what other people can possibly give you. And every little bit of knowledge you put away in that little brain bank, and it'll come in handy someday. So good luck, have a great session, and I wish all of you the very, very best. And hopefully, we'll be indoors when it starts raining. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Arakawa, for your inspiring words. So now it is my pleasure to introduce our morning keynote speaker. 
Karen McCullough is called a branding expert, a social media enthusiast, and a millennial evangelist. And she is on a mission to get you and your team excited about delivering wow service. Karen is an inspiring business speaker who draws on her varied background as an educator, a businesswoman, an entrepreneur, and retail CEO to enlighten and entertain audiences for some of the world's top businesses, universities, and associations. One of the challenges small businesses face in Hawaii is low unemployment and making it difficult to find and retain great talent and employees. Karen believes the key to this challenge is employee engagement. She has discovered what separates truly connected high engagement teams and leaders from the rest. They live their brand. I think this ties in well with providing service with Aloha, which a couple of other speakers will also be touching base on today. Karen helps organizations and leaders cut through the generational stereotypes and get back to reality by leveraging their team's strengths, enriching the work environment, and driving better results. For the last 15 years, Karen has been developing creative solutions and implementing innovation methods, inspiring people to connect, collaborate, and welcome change. We are delighted that Karen is with us today on Maui. She's here all the way from Houston, Texas to share these solutions and methods with you. Karen, thank you so much for being here. We're thank you. excited about your presence. Thank you. Can we get the slides up. Good morning, everybody. Or aloha, right? Aloha, I've got to get this right. Hang on one second, let me just figure out how the technology, do I click it or does it go? Oh, that's me, good, thank you, thank you very much. Gotta figure out, technology, right? It's gonna really get all of us. I'll be talking a little bit more about that, but before I get started, I wanna tell you a little bit about me so that you don't think I don't know anything about small business. I come from Houston, Texas, but originally I'm from Ohio. And uh, I moved to Houston and I realized that they needed me because my mom was the credit manager of a beautiful department store in Cleveland, Ohio. And when I got to Houston, although I have a master's degree in education, I said, they need me. I'm gonna open a clothing store. And so I opened a store back in 1978. Now don't do the math. I was a baby when I opened that store. I opened the store in 1978. It was a preppy store back then. I sold people madras, uh, monogram purses. It was great until it wasn't. You see, preppy died. It died about in 1986 when Madonna came out and sang a song called Like a Virgin. Who knows that song? I've gotta get, okay, good. I'm feeling you out, guys, because I'm gonna need you. When Like a Virgin came out, young girls who were preppy looked at mom and grandma in their madras, right? And then they looked over at Madonna with her bustier and her beauty mark, and they left preppy, and they left my business. After casual dress came on the scene, there were no more people ironing at all. My business was over. And so the deal was that I didn't remember this. I didn't look back. I wasn't studying what was going on. I was just working. And I didn't take time to stop and look at the changes that were going on around me. If I had maybe taken a breath and stopped working for just a moment and looked at what the future would bring, I may have made some changes. But I didn't do it. So my programs right now are a lot about looking at what's going on in the world and taking a look at where it's going. So let me ask this question. Who remembers life before 2007? Who remembers life back in the early days of 2000? Remember when it was great? Anybody in here remember? Okay, I'm checking back there. I'm looking at you, you remember, right. Life was easy back then. There was no Hulu. Yeah, yeah, there was no Vimmo. There was no Snapchat. Who knew about Orange is the New Black? Nobody. And let me tell you what, nobody was eating kale back then, right? <laughs> it was a time, it was a time where life was simpler, a time when life was pretty easy. And then what happened? 2007, Steve Jobs comes out and he says, not only are you gonna get music on this, but you're gonna get the what? You're gonna get the internet, thank you, I'll be calling on you later. You're gonna get the internet, and our lives changed. Everything after 2008 was totally different. If you left your phone at home this morning, how far would you drive to go back and get it? 
Tell me. I have heard 50 miles. I have heard people say, I can't live without my phone. How many of you sleep with your phone? Right? How many of you do not hear it ring, but you can hear a text? Yeah, it's an interesting thing. People tell me that they don't like change, and I go, help, tell me about it. And you've got your phone right there, and you can't live without it. We are adaptable to change when we like it and when we see the benefits of it. The phone has become an extension of our arm. I look around everywhere I go. I am at the airports. No one talks anymore. Did you notice that? Everybody is on their phone. You go into a restaurant. I think I see sad couples. They're both on their phones. I want to say, talk to each other, right? But the phone has changed our lives. The phone has changed our lives. The phone also really changed our customer. When we start to really look at the changes that have happened in the next in the last 10 years, Forrester Research said that the customer is changing. The customer is changing, and they call it, right now we are in the era of the customer because the customer has power. They have power. When I talk to hospitals, that patient has power. They can text the service they're getting. When you're at a restaurant, we're giving you five stars with Yelp, or maybe not. You see, the customer today has a lot of power. So let's talk about what's happening with the customer. Number one, their expectations are high. Who remembers going to a hotel where you had to bring your own hair dryer? Yeah, today I want a coffee maker. I want the hair dryer, I want a coffee maker, I want a robe. I want to put that robe on, I want that hotel, I want it all. And if I don't have it, I'm mad. I don't want to go to the gym, I want to go into their spa, right? We, the customer has an attitude right now, and it's an attitude of expectations, and the bar keeps going up. And they look different. You can't judge. You can't judge anymore. Somebody could come in with a hoodie and flip-flops. They could be a millionaire. They could own Uber. We have no idea who these people are. We look at people today, and we have to get to know them. We can't make instant decisions anymore because the world and the customer is changing, and they're better informed. As they're driving, as we're driving on 311, is that the highway we're up and down on all the time? As we're, we're Googling, we're, where's the best place to eat? What's the place around us to eat? We have power in our phone, and we're looking at you. We're looking at how many stars you have. We're reading what other people say about you. Never in the history of time has the customer had so much power, so much information, the ability just to check up on you and to see what you're doing. Yeah, and you know what? They are always connected. I am on a flight when there's Wi-Fi on the flight. If I'm sitting next to a 27-year-old, a maybe 23-year-old, and the, the Wi-Fi goes down, sometimes I'll hear them go like this. Oh, that Wi-Fi. And I look over and I go, you have no idea what life was like when I started flying. You have no idea. Shut up. Because people are mad that they don't have their Wi-Fi, right? They're mad. They want it, and they want it for free. They are very, very mad. And then... They're impatient. When do they want it? They want it now. It's in the highways, people driving. So when we start to look at the customer, we, this alone could scare me. Because I have to realize that it isn't 2006. In the last 10, 11 years, changes have happened. And the customer today has a lot of power. Not only do they have a lot of power, but they have a lot of choices. So why you? I don't mean to scare you, I am a motivational speaker, and we will get to that, but I want you to be thinking as I'm talking today, what do we want? Because it's simple, I know what we want, and you'll hear it as I'm going on. We want a connection. Why you? I want to get to know you, because there are a lot of choices out here. And so when I talk about this, it all goes around your brand. I'm in love with brands. I'm in love with them because I started in the beginning I could be some of your grandmas in here. I started in the beginning when branding first started. And today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you on a little course of branding. You say, oh, Karen, I know branding. I understand branding. Yeah, you do. But I'm going to kind of refresh your memory from where it started to what we want right now. Does that sound good? OK. That was a question. <laughs> say yes. OK, thanks. I just want to make sure you're up. So let's go back. So who in here has never been in a Kmart, a Target, or a Walmart? Has anybody never been in one? 
Okay, look around. We have 100% right now. We never get 100%, but every single person in this room has been in one of these big box store discount stores. Well, here's what happened. I have to take you all the way back to the 60s. Who remembers the 60s? This is a good question. Let me see a show of hands. Oh, God. Oh, oh, you're scaring me. Oh, okay, good. My people, remember the 60s? Some of you in here will tell me, oh, it didn't all start with Kmart, but that's where I'm starting. I'm starting with a store called Kmart. And Kmart came out of a, dis, a, a dime store called SS Kresge's. SS Kresge's was a little dime store. You could go in, you could buy penny candy, you might be able to buy cards and things, but it wasn't big. The people, the owners, the, the uh, accounting team, whomever in SS Kresge's, they all got together and they decided that they were going to build a big box store. And they were gonna put it out in the suburbs and they were going to have everything in it from maybe your baby things to all the way to tires for your car. They wanted everybody to come in the store. And in order to get you in there, they were going to have something called, now you guys from the 60s are going to remember this, they had a thing called the blue, oh, I'm waking you up, you, you old guys, I'm waking you up. It had the blue light special, remember? And the blue light special was their differentiator. It was no matter where you were in the store, they were going to have something on sale. They'd go, attention. Attention all Kmart shoppers. Right now we have on our blue light special this wonderful microphone that Karen McCall is holding. Come get one, you can get one for only a dollar. And people would go, woohoo! They didn't have to advertise. They were so excited to have this new thing called the blue light special. About the same time, in the mid 60s, there was a guy named Sam Walton who was studying Kresge's and studying Kmart. And he said, I'm gonna build something even bigger. I'm gonna differentiate from Kmart because mine are gonna be bigger and cheaper and all the products, you're not gonna believe this, in my store will be made in the USA. <laughs> it's, that's a joke right now, right? That's a joke. But that was what it was, that was the differentiator. Everything will be made in the USA, right? And it worked. It worked, he was doing great. About the same time, maybe two, three years later, a fashion store, a department store out of Minneapolis, Minnesota, called out of Dayton Hudson, it was called Dayton Hudson. They said, we're gonna get in this discount scene. We see it as the future. And they came up with what? Target. And they differentiated by calling it, they did this Target. Who, who, who I love, hey guys, I love your Target. My, my partner Nancy and I, we have been there three times so far. We have the bags. We're using the Target bags as our shopping bags right now. People love Target. They differentiated because they were gonna focus on fashion. So we have three discount stores with a blue light special, everything made in America, bigger, better, cheaper, and fashion. In the beginning, branding was about differentiating your restaurant, your business from everyone else's. And it worked, it worked. And then we have to move into branding 102. The differentiator was the beginning and then I'm moving you into the 80s. Does anybody remember the 80s in here? Oh, now we're getting there. We're getting there. Well, you remember. I know you do, Judy. You remember the 80s. I've been talking to Judy. Wait till she gets up here. The 80s were a great time. People were having fun. They were drinking their beverages. And the, the CEO of Coke, I don't really know his name because he wasn't there that long. I'll tell you why. They fired him. The CEO of Coke was obsessed with Pepsi. Oh, I'm ringing a bell, remember? And he said, what we've got to do is find out what people like more, Coke or Pepsi. So he got a crew, and they went to grocery stores, and the crew waited outside. And as soon as somebody would come out with the beverages in their cart, he would say, excuse me, ma'am. Excuse me, Lisa. Lisa, can I blindfold you? And Lisa would say, sure. She said, sure. Could you say sure today? The 80s were such an innocent time. Lisa said, sure, blindfold me, right? We blindfolded her, wait, it gets better. And then I said, Lisa, I have two beverages here. Would you drink them blindfolded? And Lisa said, sure. sure. She said, sure. She drinks them both. Which do you like better? And nine out of 10 times they picked Pepsi. But in their cart was what? Coke. They picked Pepsi, but they like Coke. It really baffled him and he said, we've got to change the formula of Coke. We're gonna make it more like Pepsi, and he did. And what was it called? Oh my gosh, we're remembering right now, New Coke. 
I'm from Ohio. We had basements in Ohio. We don't in Texas. I remember people stocking up on the old Coke because they hated the new Coke, right? People were so afraid. You took away my Coke. They fired him. When he left, they went back to Coke, and they call it today. How many years later from 1986 are we talking? They call it classic Coke. If your brand is working, this conference, you only look at what's working, and you get rid of what's not working. Sometimes when people want to rebrand, they get rid of everything. You've got to begin to look at what's working. And you've got to say, this is working. Don't mess it up. We've got to keep what works. We've got to start to get rid of what isn't working. Because Coke taught us that we have to have a consistency. Then comes Starbucks. Starbucks says, we'll be consistent. We'll be consistently expensive. <laughs> but we're going to give you an experience. When you pick up our cup, it's going to have her on it, and you're going to take that cup with you all day. No matter where you go, you're going to use your Starbucks cup. You're going to drink it. You're going to get more coffee at work, but you're going to keep it in our cup because you're going to tell everybody you are totally cool because you go and spend $5.85 on a coffee because you go to Starbucks. And Starbucks said, we're going to work on the smell in here. They had bacon at one time, and they got rid of it because it overpowered the smell of coffee. They want the music to be cool. If you come in, they're going to have all little cool things around because they are giving you more than a cup of coffee. They're giving you an experience. Now the bar is being raised. We have the differentiation. We have a consistency, and now we have to give you an experience. And that experience can come from just a smile. But I want it. And when I don't get it, I notice it. And we walk out of there and we say, well, those people were so rude. I wonder how they can be in business so long, right? Because we are wanting the experience. And then Apple comes on the scene. And Apple says, we're going to sell you stuff you don't even know you want. <laughs> Who in the world knew that I wanted an iPod? In 2004, he said, imagine a thousand tunes in your pocket. And I am thinking, I don't know about you, but I'm thinking, who the heck knows a thousand songs? That is the dumbest thing I ever heard of. Yeah, I was wrong on that one. They sold us stuff we didn't even know existed. They took us around the corner, and they educated us, and they said, imagine. I want your business now to imagine. Where is it going? Can you be that apple? Can you give us that next new thing that we don't even know we want? But we want you to be thinking. We want you to leave here, and we want you to imagine. And now, ba -ba -ba boom, Amazon comes on the scene, and they say, we know you. We know everything about you. We know what you like, and we're going to get it to you. You're going to oh, think it, and you have it, right? I mean, I'm going to think something, and I know a drone. I don't know how it's going to happen, but in the next year, it'll be here, right? Oh, I'm thinking I need a hair dryer. Oh my gosh, it's here. They have really looked at the customer's expectations. I mean, the guy's a genius. They've looked at you, they've, they've studied you. They're studying us, and they know we want it what? Now. They want, want it now. I'm gonna get those books, and bam, they're there. They're tomorrow, they're there. Sometimes he's there before I even think about it. I hear the knock on the door, Amazon! One day we ran out of paper towels. I was babysitting. My daughter, Meredith, has two little boys, and Jack is four. And Meredith and Jamie, her husband, were at the hospital having been. I had Jack for three days, and we ran out of paper towels. I said, oh my gosh, I've got to go to the store. We're out of paper towels. And he looked at me and goes, oh no, Grandma. Just Amazon Prime it. <laughs> He's three. He'll be your customer soon, right? So what do we do now? I've given you where we're going. So what's the next big thing? You see, we buy products and services, but we attach ourselves to people. We attach ourselves to people. And as you nod and as you're smiling and we're building a relationship, you're getting more from me. Because you see, when you give, I give. This is the way it goes right now. People say that young people are so committed to their technology. No, they're not. They use it as a tool, but they're committed to knowing me and having a relationship. And you're doing it with me right now. You're now in this, right? You and I are in this together. That's what we're looking for. We buy products and services, but we attach ourselves to people. So today, 
Today we're moving into a culture of engagement. And I want you to get this. We may get our products fast. We want consistency, we want differentiation, we want all of that, but we want to engage with you and we want a connection with you. I don't know, you each have a different sort of a business, so I'm not sure how you're gonna connect. But I can tell you that on this trip, your team here that brought this conference on connected with me at every touch point. From the time we said yes, until the time I landed here, we had connections and it made me excited to work here. Get it? They put their time into me. That's what you have to do. That's what we have to do. Because when people work or do business together in a culture of engagement, there's three things. If you remember nothing else from me, they remember these three things. When we have a culture of engagement, people feel connected. I'm connected to you. They feel protected. You're going to help me. You're going to make this easier for many of you that are selling services, protected that you're not going to drop me in the grease. Protected that you're not going to give me bad service or cold food. Protected that you're going to build with me a trust and respected. Everyone in this room wants to be respected and some people feel not respected. I don't know what your employees, if they feel, but we have to teach people how to get respect. And we get respect when we make eye contact and we say good morning. Immediately we get respect. We have to teach people that they have value and that they need to be respected. I believe everyone needs to connect, be connected, protected, and respected. And if you look at that, it was called CPR. CPR. My son Ben came up with that. I didn't even think of it. He goes, Mom, you're helping people breathe new life into their organization. So think about it. Whenever you forget anything I've said today, remember CPR. People want to be connected, protected, and respected, and you'll be on your way. So let me take you through connected. I've been blabbing here too much. I thought this is my little comedy slide. People want to be connected in so many different ways right now. We have so many ways to connect from the telephone to face-to-face, -to -face. so you've got to begin to understand how does your business connect? How do you connect with people? Do we connect with the phone? We may have to teach our employees how to use the phone. Many of you assume everyone knows how to use the phone, they don't. We have to go through training. We have to begin to realize that I'm really good on the phone, but I notice you're really good texting. My text, sometimes I misspell words. We have to help each other. But we have to find, figure out the best way that that customer needs connection. We have to find out the best way to connect with that customer. We have to ask. For some of you that are in services, you have to ask, how can I get in touch with you? What is the best way to connect? Give me your cell number. You want email? Let me email. If you do emails, keep them short. You want a phone call? I'll call you at 8. But we have got to begin to ask. We can't assume that the entire world texts because they don't. When we make assumptions, we go down the wrong lane. But what we're finding right now, any opportunity that you have for people to sit across from each other, for people to make contact, any opportunity that your business has where people see face to face, this is the best way. But it only works when you're a giver. You see, when you're a giver and you're talking and you nod and you lean in, we have to teach this to our staff. We have to teach them how to talk to other people. Because when we lean in a little and we smile and we nod and we get them nodding, we are stimulating, I mean, this, is, this is not a joke, a hormone called oxytocin. And the more oxytocin you can stimulate in someone face to face, the more they what? The more they like you. And when we like people, we give them more business. It's so bizarre. So what I'm doing with big companies that I'm working with, and I'm not kidding, HP, we are teaching people right now how to have meetings face-to-face, -face, how to have lunch with, with, their, with their team face-to-face, -face. because when we're face-to-face -face and we nod and don't think this is creepy, but sometimes when we touch a person, as soon as we touch, I know, I don't want to get creepy out here, but it's true, if we touch somebody just a little, I don't want any Me Too stuff going on, but when we touch somebody, I, I know, sometimes I don't know what comes out. Should I edit, take that out of, the, out of the video? When we touch somebody, this oxytocin goes crazy and people feel appreciated. So right now, look to the person next to you on both sides and tell them how happy you are that they're here. And I'll have a little drink of water.
I'm happy too. All right, that's enough. I don't have enough time. No more happiness. I'm going to get back to work. Now, you've got someone today talking on social media. This is the big deal. I went to a conference just recently, and you'll hear about it when we do the panel, and I realized that I'm missing the boat not being more productive on Facebook. And then I asked the team today, how'd you find me? And I got so excited, they found me on LinkedIn. <laughs> you never know. You never know where it's gonna come from, okay? Protected. Okay, so here's the serious part of my talk. <sighs> We've gotta think of these things. This is called a hero slide, take a picture. But I'll give you guys all my slides if you want them. Here's what people want. Here's what, your, here's what your employees want. And this goes for both the employee and the customer. They want open communications. They want to have conversations. People want to know what you value, especially when we are in business. We want people that have shared values. We value the same things. You're family oriented. And I've learned a lot since I've been here. I'm so glad I came early. You're friendly. You're warm. You have the exact same values I do. People will fall in love with this island and with you. You realize that we are attracted to people who we have shared values with, right? I think it's really good. We want you and your employees to have a sense of pride. It really goes far. I love working for this company. Tell us that. I love being here. I love, we want to hear it. We want your employees to have a sense of pride. We've got to remind people of this, that this is what the new customer wants. We want each person to take ownership. Run it like it's yours. Sometimes we have to tell people, use the doctrine of reasonableness. Sometimes we have to think about, is this the way I would do it? Because I am here protecting my company and my other employees. We want shared ownership. We want people fully present. Do you know what that means? You're present, I'm feeling you. But I've been in audiences where they're like oh, 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 and I'm talking to the top of their heads. When you're fully present, you get more. So we have to teach people to put their devices away when you're at work. I don't want you in the checkout line on your phone. It makes the customer angry. We have to teach our employees the value of this because when we're fully present, we give more and the customer feels more. These are things that you, many people don't want to hear, but we have to say, put your phones away. We don't look at our phone when you're checking someone out. You don't look at your phone. Some of us are giggling, but this is what goes on. We don't look at our phones, right? So this is how we begin to be protected. Because when I feel that you are connected to me, I feel protected from you, with you. You're going to help me have the best experience possible. You're going to be an employer that allows me to communicate and maybe give an idea or two, and you're not going to fire me just because maybe I have an innovative idea. Protection goes both ways with the employee and with the customer. But i got to move on. Your culture is now where we're moving. So now we're moving into the brand becoming your culture. And you know what people say about culture? They say that the culture is the way the employee feels. So today the employee has really the power, just like the customer had the power, your employee has the power to build your culture. Because it's what they say about you. It's how they act on the job that is showing everyone what your culture is. It's, it's kind of cool. i got to move on to respected. So they do call me the millennial evangelist. In the beginning, it didn't quite go that way. I started speaking in 2000. I started speaking on the generations in 2006. In 2006, millennials, we made fun of you. Are there any people in here that are millennials? OK, guys, this is what I used to say about you. I used to say that you were the first generation whose self-esteem is higher than your talent. Now, I don't say that anymore. I don't say that anymore, but I used to say that, and it would get a big laugh. And I was going for the laugh until I realized that they were hiring me. <laughs> now I am the millennial evangelist. I have seen the light. I have seen the light. So here's the deal. What's it like to be on the other side of you? How many here are the boss? I thought so. So what's it like to be on the other side of you? We don't know. We'd have to ask your employees, but that is something that you've got to begin to think about. How do you communicate? How do you inspire? 
How do you motivate? We're gonna talk about that in our panel that's coming up, but you've gotta to begin to think about this because you have the control. Because here's what people do. They follow you. What you do, they do, or you want them to, right? Or maybe you don't. I don't know if you do or you don't. So we've gotta figure that out and what it's like because it's all about the people. Respect is about the people. So when I first started talking about millennials, people were mad. They were called traditionalists. They were mad, they hated these kids. These kids are driving me crazy. Okay, they're always on their phone, and it was very negative. And then the baby boomer came on the scene, which I'm gonna find out in a second, and the baby boomer said, you know what? They're a challenge. I'm a little confused. I'm not quite sure how to use the Facebook. Or what is Twitter? What does the bird do? I don't know, right? And then Gen X came on the scene, they go, whatever, they'll grow up, whatever, whatever, right? And so what we've got is right now, and I see it on this island, man, I am looking at it, you've got every generation that you have to serve. I am at the hotel at breakfast and I see people coming in on walkers and I see kids sucking a pacifier. You've got them from birth to death here. You can, I'm telling you, you can have all these slides. I'm gonna give you in a PDF. I'm here for two days. You're stuck with me. So anyway, let's go through, basically, I've gotta do this in very, very quick time. We'll talk more and more about it. I wrote a book called Generations Rock. It's got so much, it's funny, and it's got a lot of information, but we've got traditionalists. Are there any traditionalists in the room? These are people that are in their 70s right now, in their mid-70s. Okay, we have no, we have one, really? Amazing, amazing, amazing. Traditionalists in the room, and we will talk a little bit about this. They are the people, they want respect. They're looking for it. Now, I am totally right now stereotyping because I have to. Baby boomers in the room, these are people born between 1946 and 1964. Any in the room, baby boomers, I thought there's gonna be a lot. They know it all. Baby boomers, we know everything, right? Come on. We know how the cow eats the cabbage. And now, we used to think we just knew everything and that was it. Now we know everything, but we also think younger people know something. And so we're learning how to stop talking and start listening. And if you aren't learning how to stop talking and start listening, you got to. Because it's time for the baby boomer to zip it and to open it. Stop and listen. And they're leaving. Many of them are leaving. They have to, before they leave and give the business to their kids or whomever, they've got to begin to share that knowledge. And the best way to do it is informally. We'll, we'll talk about it later as I'm here. Any Gen Xers in the room? 1964, what are my dates in here? 1965 to 1980. Gen Xers in the room, they are the whatever, right? This is the generation that had independence and freedom. They could stay out until the street lights came on, right? This is a generation that's very, very much about who they are and they don't like to micromanage. Unfortunately, they are sandwiched in between two of the most self-absorbed generations out there. So Gen X, we've got to work on you. And do we have any millennials in the room? Millennials, this is the future. Woohoo! They're getting Yeah, because they're the children of the baby boomers. Now the baby boomers used to go woohoo. Now they're doing it. Woohoo! Millennials! I have learned millennials. I love you and I've learned to listen because you know faster, but not always better. So I could teach you something and I want respect. Who doesn't? If you get nothing else out of my talk on the generations, each generation brings something to the table. We've got to learn how to have dialogue and conversation, and we've got to learn how to take, especially as business owners, the best of each generation and help them sometimes tone it down. So we hear negative talk. We hear negative talk, you're lazy, you're entitled, you're all of this, and then we hear the millennials saying, yes, but you are a micromanager, and here's the biggest complaint I get from millennials, especially those that are in more of the professional end. We're underutilized. There is so much more I can do, and I am sure that a millennial today came up with that tremendous wordle, which I am copying. I love it. You see, I learn more from millennials. Okay, you're right, I, I take a little, I steal from them. Because their ideas are cutting edge. We need to listen to them because we have another generation coming on the scene, Gen Z. And Gen Z are most of your kids that are at home and we don't really know what they're like, but we'll talk about it later. Because I have to rush, because I want to play this game with you because I have a little bit of a game. So what, what do people want today? Mostly millennials, their carrot is autonomy. 
They want freedom. A lot of them, and I'm sure Judy's going to share that with us, right? They want work schedules that are loose and free because they like to travel. They want autonomy. They want mastery. They want to learn. They want to learn. They want to learn more to grow, and they want purpose. So that is their carrot. So I learned something from Jimmy Kimmel. When Jay left, I missed Jay for like 20 minutes. Um, does anybody know who I'm talking about, Jay? Who, who misses Jay? OK, I'm sorry. Who, who loves Jimmy? Who has no idea who Jay and Jimmy are? Anybody? So here's what we're going to do. I'm all about collaboration. This is what I'm about. I'm about ideas and face to face. I'm about, I talk to you and I get an idea. So here's what I, I want you to get in groups. Move your little bodies till you're with four, four or five and just huddle real quick. Get in a group. Just move your chairs. You got to move, guys, because you can't. You got to whisper. Hurry up. If I go a little over, is that OK? A little over. OK, guys, I got a time here. Here's how we're going to do this. Just get with them. You're good. Just, just sit on the floor. You don't want to miss this. OK, guys, I'm going to play a theme song from a TV show. Nancy, you cannot play. You, you know all my, you have to sit over there. Nancy, you know every answer. You cannot play. I am, you, can, you can sit there and laugh, but you can't tell them. I'm going to play a theme song, and you have to huddle, whisper. The first slide will be the music. The second slide will be the answer. If you get it right on the second slide, you do this. Make a fist and go, yes. Let me see you do that. Yes. Oh, gosh. You're going to be great. OK. But don't do it on the first slide. Wait till the second one. Here we go. Hope it's loud. Whisper, whisper, shh, shh, okay, ready? Law and order. Okay, who didn't get it? Who did not get law and order? Okay, oh my gosh, I'm worried. Okay, shh, here we go. Shh, 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 shh. Ready? Seinfeld. Oh! Oh, you're a humor group. You're not really murder. Okay, I get it. How about this one? I'll give you a hit. Buffy. Who got it? Who got it? Do a team. Oh, yes. Let me see you do it. Now, they're embarrassed that they got Buffy. but. One group got Buffy. Now, who was it that got Buffy? OK, the weird, weird one, weird one. OK, here we go. Oh, sure, you said out loud. Mash. OK, this one, I want to see how cool you really are. You got 50% cool. Here we go. Game of Thrones. Woo! Oh, I love you already. What a group. Okay, here we go. the words. This is a quiz. Let's go. A little attitude. Let's see some attitude. Go. Now this is a story all about how my life got flipped, turned upside down. And I'd like to take a minute, just sit right there. I'll tell you how I became the prince of a town called Bel Air. <laughs> the prince of Bel Air. All right, last one. Let's give them a hand. 
You all get a free book. Oh, they didn't get it all. Forget the book. OK, who, got, who missed one? Stand up if you missed just one. Let's take a look. All right, let's give him a hand. So my question is, what did, what did it take to win? It took all of you. Some of you knew one, some of you knew another one, and that's what work is all about. It's going to take the ability to have a conversation, to have staff meetings that are exciting and fun, to be, have people feel trust that they can talk the truth about what's going on. Because when we build connected, protected, respected, we build a team that is going to grow. I'm going to tell you one quick story. I have five. I'm actually going to be end on time. I'm going to tell you my closing story, OK? My closing story goes like this. When I came out of retail, which is where I started with you, I only sold clothes to women. And I was in retail almost 20 years. And I sold to women who bought suits. So these were all corporate women. And I heard their stories over and over behind the dressing room walls, right, as they say. When I started speaking, I thought my audience should be what? Women. I thought I would do a women's conference. But a guy named Garrison Wynn came up and he said, you know what, he had heard me speak. He said, you should speak to corporate. I'd like to be your coach. Well, if I picked a woman coach, which would be great, but I would be speaking to women. And I would be doing women's conference. I wouldn't be here. But because Garrison, a man, gave me his point of view and his perspective, we just, I decided to go in that direction. And I took a man for my coach. He took me in a totally different journey than it would have been a woman. In 2008, Thanksgiving of 2008, I got a call from a huge client who I had nine gigs with for 2009. It was Sun Microsystem, who is now Oracle. And they said, we're canceling the whole year. The world's falling apart, the end of 2008. In 2009, I had no work, I, a totally empty calendar. But there was a 23-year-old African-American young girl in Houston who was quite a big deal in the Facebook. She knew social media. And she was a social media guru. She was 23. We had nothing in common. We met for coffee, and we decided that if we partnered, she would teach me social media back in 2009. She would teach me the ins and outs, and I would teach her how to be present on a stage. We worked together, and we formed a new company called Social Tunities. And we taught all of the corporations in Houston how to use social media to grow their business. 2009 was my biggest year in my history of my work because I partnered with a 23-year-old African-American who had nothing in common with me but a desire to succeed. She's my best friend today. She's on the stages everywhere. I talk to her almost every other day about where she is going. Her name is Crystal Washington. I learned a big lesson. I learned if you hire and hang out with people just like you, you'll get what you already know. You'll do what you already do, and you'll attract the people you already attract. But when you widen your net, when you begin to look for the new ideas and you have the ability to listen, you can grow a business that will sustain and be here for the future. Thanks, guys. I'm Karen McCullough, and I'll be here for two days, so we'll be seeing you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you.